that you shot, Let's All Hate Toronto, that was through Elevator Films? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I had my cinematic experience with Elevator Films on a production called Escape to Canada. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, no, I did some work on that too, actually. Me and Chris Goodwin actually started a cafe in Hamilton. So I was at that cafe. I was shooting there. You were, eh? There, yeah. I was a camera guy there one day. There was like, um, you guys did a, uh, a protest walk. Chris and Clark's Up in Smoke Cafe is what we called it. And, and I mean, certainly when I saw Let's All T Hate Toronto, I mean, going to school at Mohawk College, you know, I felt inclined to tell everybody about it, pointing out just this uh, this cultural divide that exists, right? Yeah. Plus, I mean, the, the other thing I like about that film is it's, it's not like we're, if you were to do a film like Let's All Hate London, mm -hmm. or Let's All Hate New York, people actually hate it enough to blow it up. Yeah. Like in Canada, it's more like, Toronto's your asshole big brother. It's done with, with good naturedness in Canada. It's not real hate. It's it's kind of like a it is like a national joke to say Toronto sucks, but it's said with a bit of love, you know. Exactly. And there's a bit of contempt yeah. with those that don't get to enjoy the city. Can you tell me how it tied in with your iBorg project? It didn't really, except for the fact that I was doing an eye patch for mixing up so everyone thought it was a joke. Like I I just had it removed and there's a an interim pro you know, period between when you get it removed and you get a prosthetic eye in. CBC, the lens, was interested. And uh, Let's All Hate Toronto did very, very well for them, so they were quite pleased. Uh, like when we aired on CBC, the lens, it was their highest ever rated documentary. I'm pretty positive right now that I, that about the prospect of getting some new media funding. Cause the Canadian Television Fund has become the Canadian Media Fund. Mm -hmm. The problem with the iBoard project is a little bit all-consuming. Like, it's not easy making a wireless video camera, so I really had to, you know, in the past year, I've basically done corporate videos to make money, and uh, I've spent a lot of it on doing, like, a world-class engineering project. So I'm finally at yeah. the stage now where the eye works. I'm uh, holding on to the shot of the eye working and, and have a lot of ideas about how to make it an interactive experience. And how does the augmented reality, how is that going to tie in? Well, there's kind of two stages for the way I'm going to roll out the eyes. I'm going to create an iBorg app. It can go on a smartphone like a, you know, uh, iPhone, for example. So when you look through your, look at the screen on your iPhone, you'll see... Um, what I'm seeing, including blinking and glancing around and, and what have you. So one idea, for example, to make it interactive is, is I'm going to probably partner with a company called Seastreet, and that's a company that um, Ash Kutcher, for example, uses a lot. Like if he's backstage at Saturday Night Live, he turns on his iPhone video camera and broadcasts live to Ustream.tv. But there's also a Twitter stream so that people can communicate with him while he's filming. And give him instructions to do hilarious things. Right. And so he hasn't really... He's Ashton Kutcher, so he doesn't have to do... Much. I mean, the fact that he's backstage at Saturday Night Live and he's Ashton Kutcher, he doesn't really have to be that creative at this point. Mm -hmm. But for me, for example, one thing I might do is... I still wear an eye patch, because um, I'm a one I do and I, you know, I just don't care about trying to look normal. And so if I switch the eye patch to my good eye, all of a sudden I'm effectively blind. Mm -hmm. Who's going to see for me that's going to be the audience? And this is a classic case of interactive dramatic irony. If, if you know dramatic irony, it's, it's, it's like, for example, if you're watching a horror film and you're like, oh, no, don't go in that, don't go in the basement, don't go in the basement, there's like an evil guy down there. It's when the audience knows something that you don't. And it's one of the most original, compelling reasons get somebody interested in in something dramatic. And almost like a choose-your-own-adventure kind of effect. Right. So it was kind of depressing. I went to go, the last film I thought I might see was Pink Panther with Steve Martin, which sucks. I'm like, oh my yeah. God, I'm do the last movie I see. But it, so with the iBoard app, I switched the iPatch. Oh, you're seeing what I see. You have the ability to Twitter communicate with me, and I'll also set up an audio channel. And... You're basically looking through the eye of somebody who's blind. 
Wow. And giving them instructions and interacting with them, and and I'll give uh, users an opportunity to level up. Uh, you know, I'm also thinking of doing something called uh, socially awkward missions. It's a voyeuristic experience. <laughs> Somebody who is a user that I'm going to reward, uh, I'll give them, you know, for example, one of my weird augmented reality T-shirts. Yep. Uh, which is teasing people about the future of how I'm going to bring augmented reality in. Yeah. But then they'll be able to sort of give me instructions, not unlike the David Letterman thing where he used to send a guy out that had a video camera. Oh, sure, yeah. But there's going to be a very interesting film language, and this is one of the interesting things about the eye, is it's, even though it's a mechanical camera in my eye socket, yeah. the film language I get is much more the way that we actually see. So if you think about other forms, like acting, for example, acting used to be what I would call on a tripod, very perfect, eye of angel, kind of stiff, stiff version of reality. Yeah, it's static, right? It's static, yeah. I mean, if you think about acting, too, it's, you, could, you could say it was on a tripod. It's like, Philip, what is going on, you know? Yeah. And that's, no, that's nothing like the way that we act, but it was a, an accepted uh, language of of interpretation of reality. Sure, So sure. then Marlon Brando came along and he started sort of mumbling and talking and, and, and acting the way we actually act. Not perfectly, but much more naturalistic. And so the cool thing about the eye is it, it actually moves, like it glances, and there's blinking, and you see my eyelashes. So the irony is, is that it's... Um, it's a mechanical eye in my head, but the film language I get is much more similar to the way that we look at the world when we're experiencing the world. Like, we don't come floating perfectly down from trees and then sit on a tripod when we're looking at the world. We're walking around, we're glancing, we're, 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 our eyes move. Sometimes we blink much more quickly when we're feeling different emotions. And the, the other great thing for me is uh, I'll be able to achieve something really magical, I think, which is direct pupil-to-pupil -pupil eye contact, which is something that other documentary makers have been leaning towards. Instead of the classic shot of a guy talking to somebody off camera mm -hmm. with three lights and a camera crew in front of them, I'll have somebody that I don't necessarily have to tell them I'm wearing a camera eye because I can paint it like my own. And the way that I'll be capturing the image is, is the way that we look at people. So the documentary subject is acting much more the way they naturally act because you stick a bunch of cameras and lights around the person. They're not acting like themselves. They're acting like a version of themselves. Absolutely. So on both ends of the documentary formula, the subject and the interviewer, and the way the subject looks directly in, into my pupil, uh, it's much more like an actual conversation that you have with somebody and, and re-experiencing that that reality. It's much more sincere. <laughs> yeah, unless, I mean, you also have to put in, you know, personality. Like, it's, it's, some documentary makers are very good at getting a sincere reaction. It's kind of dependent on me and my interviewing skills. Because I can be very insincere. <laughs> but, you know, so can people when they're interacting with people in reality. Absolutely, and is this a 1080p picture? Like, oh no way, no way. No, it no we hardly no, no. It's low fi It's like uh, same quality as like let's say uh, last year's low end Nokia video camera. The aesthetic you get oddly is very similar. If you watch the first Terminator, mm -hmm. there's a certain aesthetic and quality to the video that Terminator gets. Mm -hmm. And, and they show you in the film, you understand, oh, this is Terminator's point of view right now. Yeah, the POV cam. Yeah, and so it's it's kind of like that. It's There's actually a filter in Final Cut Pro people use now to take this footage that's too high in quality, and you add this filter to it so that in film language terms you understand, oh, this is like a, a slightly lower quality video that that fizzles once in a while, like, to, to, and people immediately understand, oh, this is some sort of um, 80s version of a post-apocalyptic point of view. 